a particular interest into this tribe and risk having that many of them around at arm's reach back at home is because of the nature of the tribe. Is because our elders tells us that this is the tribe who has the anointing, the blessing, the gift and the talent to gear us up. That tribe has the anointing to dress the kings and the queens of Israel. What does it mean? From that tribe, we get our best fashion designers. From that tribe, we get our best craft jewelry designers and maker and so on. So they are the ones who had the kings and queens of Africa looking so fabulous, yes. It was them, that's the tribe anointed for that. They are our fashion experts, our stylists, our designers, our art and craft experts. Among them, you find the best tailors and the best seamstress. So you see, the most elaborated jewelry, it, be, it would be them. Anything that you see that clearly takes a huge amount of time and stuff, they are the one with the required patience to create these masterpieces. They were the best in designing textile, clothing, accessory, name it, anything to make us look royal, like the royal we are. They are our art and fashion expert. Now you have to understand that with all these gifts and talents, the tribe of Yazabulani became very appealing to the European. So colonial Europe showed a particular interest into this tribe. To cut a long story short, the reason why the colonial Europeans had such a heavy presence of the children of Yazibulani on their homeland is because they were kidnapped, snatched, stolen to go and dress the European kings, to go and create their fashion industry, to go and give them a makeover. This information can quickly be verified if you conduct a little study or a little research on the European fashion. Let me just take you back into memory lane. Okay, let me show you the European, how they were gearing up around the time they came and ended with our world. All right, now, keep in mind, the European showed up in our kingdom in the early stage of the 17th century. All right, so early stage of the 1600. So by the time we got to the 1630s, all our kingdom, at least in the Congo land, we already had fallen. And these people were now in full possession and control of our people. So shall we? Let's continue. So this is them around the time they came to mess with us. Okay, early stage of uh, 17th century. This is them. And as you could see, this was their so-called fashion. Okay, what do I see there? I see a I see bunch of people wrapped around fabrics that looks like somebody's curtain, fabrics that looks like somebody's tablecloth. You know, in the name of fashion, they do these atrocities. This is them. By taking a closer look at their fashion, it screams that they don't know what they're doing. And I can't just, I just can't imagine the shock of our ancestry looking strange looking people dressed very strangely showing up on their shores so yeah this was them this is what they call fashion okay like for example the ladies around the time they came and messed with us this is how the ladies were dressing what do you see there you know they i think i guess they were putting more emphasis on the breast part because it seemed like they're just hiding behind sheets big sheets Okay, they call the style the bowl gown. That was their style. They will put an emphasis around the breast. I, I believe the chest area, I guess that's what they're working with. And everything will be a, a balloon underneath it. This was their, their fashion. Look at the choice of uh, fabric. Very plain. It looks like you could see that in somebody's bedroom as a curtain. Or you could see that on somebody's table as a tablecloth or bed sheet or something. Not something to go out with. Okay, this was their fashion when they came. Now let's go, let's go and check out the guys. So 
in the early stage of the 17th century, as you could see on this picture. So these are the guys uh, around the, the king, the archduke, uh, the duke and the duchess, the lords and the ladies. Yeah, in their court, in their royal court. This is how they were gearing up. So you see these guys wearing what, pantyhose? You know, their fashion really was lacking. Their fashion was beautiful. I mean, they, they look like clown, look at that. You know, the, the, we call it the Arlequin pants. <laughs> and these are the guys around the, the, the king. This was their, their fashion. You see guys wearing pantyhose, like mini skirt. And they, these were the, the la bourgeoisie. These were like the, the people around the king and the king himself. This is how they were gearing up. Okay, now fast forward. By the time we reach the mid 17th century, you could already notice a clear change in their fashion. Now let me show you an image of them evolving their fashion after capturing our fashion designers. So now the ladies' dresses now start having a shape on it. Okay, not only they're showing the, 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 the part of the breast and by, this, by that time, you know, you could see they start putting emphasis on the waistline. Okay, they're now showing more than just the breast. Now it's like, oh, we have something going on here. And where did they get it from? They got it from the women they were holding as slaves. After capturing many of our people, you could tell in their fashion how their fashion had evolved over the time. Now, fast forward 18th century, the dresses are shrinking. So, as you could notice, they're no longer using excessive fabrics like they used to before. Remember the previous uh, pictures, right? Remember, back in the 17th century, their gowns were so huge, you could hide a whole family underneath it. It was just too much fabric, unnecessarily. So now they're applying measure. You know, now they have our people teaching them the how. All right, there's less fabric and they are accentuating more. They're bringing more attention to the waistline. So you will see their fashion progress and move and morph with the time. They started adapting their fashion based on our body shapes. You know, they were amazed by the shape of the African woman. 18th century, this is how the French royal were now dressing. Check this out. This is them. Okay, so in this style, you know, with the, the, the large, the voluptuous, they are here. So they were wearing a, a crinoline, what they call crinoline, so that it gives them a hump in the back, an artificial hump, so that it gives them the impression, the illusion of the lady having a voluptuous back, just like the voluptuous back of the African women. As you know, they're masters of illusion. Now, if an African woman is to wear that dress, she doesn't need a crinoline. Her curves alone will extend toward the back and ensure that shape. So they had to recreate or try to recreate everything. Another major invention in the European fashion that we saw popping up in the 18th century, which has a direct connotation with Africa, is the corset. Uh, let me take this opportunity to give you a little history of what we know about corset. Corset were invented by us African women, all right? In Africa, when a woman gives birth, we have this homemade corset our mothers make for us. They take a piece of fabric, preferably cotton, and they wrap it around your abdomen. They wrap it around very tightly, at least for the four weeks following us giving birth. So that's what our mothers are still doing until today. And we know that our mothers taught them because at that point they were their maids. All our kingdoms had already fallen. These people were already in possession and full control of our people. Now they were raising their children, they were bathing them, they were teaching them everything. So our mothers are the one who taught them that you don't need to hide underneath big ball gown. You can wrap the tummy and your abdomen will fall back into place after giving birth. So when it comes to the guy's fashion, in the 18th century, we noticed that 
their, their bottom are getting longer. Okay, they're still wearing pantyhose, all right, but it's just that they're no longer wearing mini skirt or little shorts that with pantyhose. They are now, you know, wearing little capris. And toward the end of the 18th century, we saw them started wearing pants, okay, which was a big innovation. Another thing which drew my attention when it comes to the sudden fashion innovation after getting hold of our people is I noticed that in the course of the 18th century, the European headgears started looking like African headgears. Check this out. Here we see a mannequin with a lady's outfit with a headpiece, what we call in Africa head wrap and it was typical of our mothers they took that fashion over there so the royals started covering their head because i'm sure our mothers told them that when we wrap our head we are crowning our head because we are born into royalty now in the past these were the typical head gears now you could see their hat it was like the feather, like the musketeer. That was typical, their stuff. Now, check this out. Look at the headpiece. This is what we call the lumbumba, the lumbumba headpiece, you know, with the leopard skin. This is typical of the African kings and prince, the headpiece on that mannequin. So you could already tell that they are now in possession of our people. So you can already find several influences of our fashion. So you could see that for many years, you know, they used our forefathers to redesign this European, you know, wardrobe. These people were wearing curtain-looking fabrics. They would rub themselves with that nonsense and look a hot mess until they got a hold of our people. By the time they got a hold of our people, you see a major change in their fashion. Anything that was like presentable, like royal looking like it was us, our people, dressing them, styling them and so on. This is how our queens in Africa were dressing with our expensive fabric. Look at the, the heads and stuff. Any of them can always argue, but we know that we, the Africans, we have always been of the most fashionable. This is even before we were established in the Congos and West Africa. Meet one of our very own queens. This is one of our most stylish and fierce queen. Queen Amani Rinas of the Kingdom of Kush back in ancient Nubia. From 40 BC to 10 BC, this is even before the migration of our people. So you see, we were already fly. We taught them how to dress properly. Now look how this queen was rocking it. Back in the days, long, long, long before the European came around, right? We already had it. We already had that fashion touch. We already had that divine beauty and elegance. Our elegance has always been well put together, very effortlessly, all right? This is another image of that queen. Look at her, yes. And you could see how our fashion will accentuate the waistline because this is our forte. We have that hourglass shape, like they call it, all right? So in our dressing, we want to make sure we, we show it off. They don't have that shape. So, and you could see that with time, the European women started wearing what they call corset to try to force themselves to give themselves that shape it, because they were under pressure of their slave. The women they were holding as slaves and their husbands were lusting after them. So they came up with the corset to tidy it up and they'd be like, you know, trying to recreate that hourglass shape. The French bourgeoisie, the, the, the court of the, the kings. So we went from this to this. So now you see that the work, it has already been done. They've been, you know, at this point now, people have taught them how to properly bath, you know, how to properly gear up, how to appear. So they didn't have that small waist and wide hips and stuff so they started creating it 
They started coming up with dresses with corset. As you know, we have always been the ideal. My dear Doris, we are it. <laughs> People who want to be like you, they're going to want to dress like you. They're going to want to take your stylist from you. They're going to want to take anybody who does anything and embellishing to you. So that's exactly what they did. As you could see, there's many of our people from the tribe of Yazibulani who were taken into colonial Europe. Why there's such a strong presence of our people pertaining to the tribe of Yazibulani in colonial Europe. And as you could see, the countries are listed, the countries. Germany had, what, nine locations. France has like six or seven. Italy, each one of them, Spain, Portugal. Many of them have their Kikongo name on their land. It's to let you know, whatever particular anointing or gift or talent your tribe was known for, they will uproot you from home and bring you, take you wherever they see fit for you to do it. They did it for everything. And our builders and our agriculturers, those who were responsible for growing the crops, vital crops such as rice and stuff, they scooped up everybody. Based on the landmarks I was able to find, so we can say with confidence that Nani shipments containing the royals of the kingdoms of Yazigulani were dumped in Germany. Eight in France, seven in Italy, seven in Portugal, six in Spain, four in Belgium, and three in Switzerland. I'm sure that there are more than that, but these are the ones I could find and I encourage you guys to do the same. Go out there and find your brothers and sisters. If you're watching us from Europe and uh, you are clearly African looking but you don't know how you wound up or your, but you don't know how your people wound up in Europe, this is the reason, okay? Now Germany, I don't know if Germany still have survivors of our regional because we know that Germans were systemically castrating our men. So I don't know, but if you're watching us from Germany and you are African looking, know that you come from the tribe of Zibulani, okay? I trust that they're still out there. Our elders tells us that the Zibulanis are very artistic yet resilient and bold. So I trust they made it. Fast forward in today's world. What do we know about the countries that captured many of our people from Yazdibulani? We know Paris is now known as the world fashion capital, and so is uh, Milan in Italy. Centuries later, after kidnapping those of Yazibulani, they had them reinvent their entire fashion and help them create a fashion industry that, you know, had been pushing dominance over everybody. That's why their fashion are never nothing typical to them. In their fashion, even back in the 17, 18, all the way to today, you can pinpoint influences, African influences. You know why? Because our people had always been in the background designing, sketching, and dressing them. So these are people who didn't know nothing about fashion. They didn't even know what they were doing. They were looking ridiculous. By the time they got a hold of our people, you see sudden fashion innovation. It goes without saying that the colonial European used the tribe of Yazibulani to build their fashion empire. The tribe of Yazibulani was particularly targeted because of its gifts and talent and anointing in creating artistic design, in creating anything grandiose, beautiful, any fashion that can stand the test of time, they have the secret to it. The kingdoms of Yazabulani were doubly targeted. So when the European went after them, they went after them with two main goals, to capture enough 
to bring to the America to work on the plantation and to capture more of them to take to Europe so that the cotton our children are picking up in the Americas for them are processed and designed and sold and sold uh, in Europe by their brothers from Zibulani's. You may not have known that, but now you know. So I want to call your attention, especially to our children who are, are there. I know that many of you are so obsessed with these European brands, but as you buy that Gucci, as you buy that Louis Vuitton, as you buy that uh, whatever you buy from the Italians and from the French, just know that by doing so, you're still being a slave. You're still feeding the system that crippled you. You're still feeding the system that enslaved your ancestor and the system that is still enslaving you. Just know that those brands were built on the back sweat, blood, and tears of our ancestors, the children of Yah Zabulani. Okay, in conclusion, the tribes of Africa, which are also known as the tribes of Israel, because all the kingdoms, the European, went and destroyed in Africa, came from the 12 original kingdoms. There were kingdoms, not tribes. So as we go further in our study, you can now realize that each tribe had a specific gift or talent they were known for. The European coming against us, invading us, and doing all the things they did, they had a lot to win. Okay, so it goes without saying that, as you could see, the European have created their fashion industry on the backs of the African, on the talents of the African, on the intellect, on the genius of the African. So you could see that they took more than just plantation labor, they took intellectual labor, they took everything from us. And today, they have the nerve, the audacity, to talk down on Africa, to call it, you know, shithole country and so on and so on. When their forefathers have raised them on the blood and sweat of the Africans. Now let's move on to the next patriarch, from whom, according to our elders, we get our best scientists. Okay, my people, so for more interesting videos such as this one, you can subscribe and become a Patreon of Nubia The Path To Return. The link is in the description box below. If you want to watch more videos about the 12 sons of Israel, we have the whole series as I go adding the videos, but you can already watch those I have pre-recorded before. Everything is in the description box below. So my dear children, peace, love, and unity. Until next time. Mwah.